Welcome to episode 128 of the Gluns for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lapore. I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for watching and listening to us as well, wherever you are. Now, on today's show, the Leafs are not playing very well. Even though they've won two games in a row, they are 3-3-1 three, three and one since our last podcast. There's a lot of things that I'm just not loving right now about this hockey team, but Martin Jones is the number one goalie at the moment. Uh, Everyone else stinks. Uh, The defense core has been, yeah, they've they've been fine. Austin Matthews, 30 goals. Uh, We're going to talk about William Nylander and a potential contract extension. We're going to talk about the NHL All-Star game in Toronto. The first 32 players have been named to the team. So we'll get into that. We'll get into who else we think will be named to the team via the fan vote. Um, so there's a lot to get into. But before we get into all that, it is officially time to welcome in my partner in crime, Mr. Michael Lapore. How are you doing today, man? Doing very well, Anthony Bruno. As always, very happy to be here. But there is part of me that's pretty bummed, man. I just got back from beautiful, absolutely stunning Metcalf, Ontario. My kids had a game over there, and uh, we got shellacked, bro. Absolutely oh shellacked at Larry Robinson Arena. It's like he knew I was a Leaf fan or something and just put the hicks on me. But you know what's funny? I had a good feeling going in because the way they set up this arena, there's six locker rooms, and each locker room is a different team. It's like a theme. We got the Leafs locker room. So all over the walls was like – their retired numbers, their Stanley Cups. I was going through like everything. I mean, so I'm like, wow, I mean, we're going to take this one. All the stars are aligning and we got absolutely killed. I'm getting the feeling uh, your boy, Michael Lepore is on the hot seat. I don't know. Some unhappy oh, parents. Oh God, what's going on? Man? I thought you were on the fast track to like the ECHL and all of a sudden oh, you're man. on the hot seat. What's going on here? It's a genuine debate who gets shit on more and what has more pressure like National Hockey League coach or minor, my minor hockey league coach with the the shit you hear and deal with from the stands and the parents, but it's all good. One thing I will say, Larry Robinson Arena, shout out. It's one of those fucking old barns, man. It's an old barn and they have the, uh, the canteen. A lot of these new arenas, they don't have that canteen where you get like, I'm going to be so Canadian here. They got the poutine and they got the hot dogs and that stuff. So it's a great place to go. I like it because you don't, you don't see buildings like that really anymore now they're all modern with glass and natural light so it's nice to go into uh, an old barn once in a while well you're probably getting yelled at by parents from the stands you're getting oh, death fuck. stares from parents when you're walking to your car after the game so let's let's get your mind off of that Lepore, yeah. and let's jump right into the leaves so as i said right off the top i know they've won two games in a row but i'm still not that impressed because every time I just kind of look at the numbers. I compare them to the rest of the teams around the NHL, some other teams in the Atlantic division. I'm still not that excited, honestly, about this Leafs team. And I know that they've been playing better. And on the last show, I kept going on and on about how they've been going through all this adversity and we, you know, they deserve more credit and that we should actually be praising them for the effort that they've put in this season, despite all the injuries and the other crap that they've dealt with, like Elia Samson all falling off the face of the earth Fuck. with his 862 save percentage and being basically the worst goalie in the NHL. So they've been getting through a lot of these things, but I keep going back to the numbers, man. Like they're still not controlling the play like they're used to. They're still giving up a lot defensively. Uh, they're still losing to shitty teams as we saw against Columbus. And I know that that was a Samsonov situation, but what are your general thoughts about this team right now? Because even though they're 19, 10 and seven, they're on pace for 103 points. I honestly don't feel that great about the team at the moment. Yeah. I'm, clearly I'm not ecstatic. I don't think any Leafs fans ecstatic right now, but th- there's two things. Okay. The, the first one to me is this is not the team. This is not the team that's going to go into the playoffs. I think there were a lot of changes last year, and people thought there were too many changes at the deadline. I think we may see even more this year. Shaliving is not going to hold back. I think this roster is going to get revamped to the full extent. I really do. On the topic of their play, 
I'm too sided, Bruno, because of course I want to see them play really well. I want to see them dominate. I want to see what I'm used to in the regular season for that matter. But is it a matter of this team not playing to expectation or they've been dealing with a lot and they're doing a pretty good job of getting through it? And when I say dealing with a lot, it's not a matter of excuses. It's, you know, we sometimes say, well, I'll go two sided on this. If someone said to us, well, Austin Matthews at this point of the season is going to have 30 goals. We'd be like, wow, the Leafs must be flying. They must be top of the division, whatever. But we're not because on the other side, we have Ilya Samsonov who just completely forgot how to play goalie. He completely forgot how to be a hockey goalie. So that's even that out to a significant extent. And those games with Sammy, man, it's impossible to win. It is at, like the worst goals at the worst times. His body language is terrible. Even when he saved it, he didn't look confident. Just it's all between the ears with Sammy. And that affects the whole team. The old saying, you grip your stick too tight. So there's that. They had injuries on the blue line. So, of course, I want to see them be better. And I expect them to be better. I do. I, I don't want to be copping out here saying, oh, they're, they're you know, the, here are all these excuses. And this is why they're on pace for 103 points and not 120 points. Because I expect better from this lineup. But at the same time, I think there's a strong argument that they've dealt with a lot. Terrible goaltending, injuries to the blue line, and they're still on pace for 103 points. So when this when they are able to really sta- establish their roster, I'm expecting big things. I really am. And to get some consistency out of the goaltending, well... It can, I mean, it can only get better based on what we've had from Sammy. So if that falls into place and this roster gets to where I think it's going to be, I'm going to have very high expectations. I haven't given up on the division, man. And I don't say that in the way of like optimism or hope. I'm just saying it in the way of it's my expectation. It's my expectation by the end of the year for them to be fighting for the division crown. Yeah, I think the division is totally in play. Just looking at the standings right now, and this is being recorded on Thursday night, and there's a massive Thursday night slate going on right now. The Leafs are not in action. Yeah, Boston's losing. (laughs) They are seven points behind the Boston Bruins, and they've both played 36 games, three points behind the Panthers with a game in hand on Florida. So this is not like last season where Boston just pulled away, had one of the greatest seasons in NHL history, I still think the Leafs are totally live to win this division. And if they can figure their shit out and sign a couple defensemen and even bolster the forward group for that matter, like, you know, true living is going to make some moves. You alluded to it. Like there is just no chance that the team you're seeing right now is going to be the final team that we see after the trade deadline. This team is too good for true living, not to make a move. And again, I just talked, you know, for five minutes about how I don't think this team is great and I don't have a lot of confidence at the moment, but they're at the end of the day, they're still a good hockey team. They're on pace for 103 points. We all know they're going to make the playoffs and you're in the prime years right now of Matthews, Marner and Nylander and John Tavares isn't getting any younger. True living would be a complete imbecile to not make moves at the trade deadline to bolster this roster. So I think it's safe to say the team we see now is not going to be the team that we see at the end of February, beginning of March whenever the yeah. trade deadline is this year. So I don't know, man. I, I, I listen, I know they've been going through a lot, but when I look at the goalies, like Martin Jones has been ridiculous, man. Yeah. Like you look at his stats and this is a guy who's been terrible the last like four or five seasons, sub 900 save percentage but with the Leafs in 10 games, a 930 save percentage and 2.20 goals against average. Shit. So when you look at the team's goaltending numbers overall, five on five save percentage, the Leafs are 16th in the NHL. So basically league average in terms of five on five save percentage. So the goaltending hasn't been that terrible. But when I look at some of the other numbers, 23rd in shots against per game, whereas last year, the Leafs were seventh in the league in shots against. And I know that's not like that advanced of a stat, but. They're giving up a lot more. Even when you look at five-on-five goals against per 60, 19th in the league. Five-on-five expected goals against per 60, 25th in the league. I'm not going to go over all the numbers here because I'm going to bore everybody to death. But I just think that they're giving up 
a lot more right now than they have in previous years. And it helps obviously that Matthews is on pace to score 69 goals and Nylander's on pace for 116 points. So like there are some good things happening. Tavares, once again, even though we all kind of thought that he was, you know, declining. And I mean, I, again, I've kind of called him like sort of washed up at certain points and that aged incredibly poorly. He's on pace to be like a point per game player again. Marner's doing his thing. Like there are still some good things happening. Bertuzzi's been playing well. Mm-hmm. I mean, even when you look at the blue line, like Simone Benoit, he's been solid. Like who thought he would be a factor this season? And he's actually been pretty good. So there are some, a lot of positive things with this team, but they got to find a way to just go on a run here. Like look what Edmonton's done. Edmonton's 14 and three in their last 17 games after we all shit on them and said, I mean, even I said, I, I, I sent out a tweet when they lost to San Jose. I said, good night, Edmonton, your season's over. See, I called them to catch the Canucks, but the problem, they're winning, but the problem is the Canucks are doing their part and they keep winning too. So, that you know what, though? Drinking. They're making it interesting. I believe right now, as of recording, they're like six points back of the Kings for third in the Pacific. So, uh, your boy Anthony Bruno is getting a little bit, a uh, little bit worried here that the Oilers are just going to like win out the rest of the season and make me look like a complete idiot. But yeah, we'll see what happens w- with regard to the Leafs. And I had this conversation with someone. Um, it came up when. They asked me if I thought Matthews was going to score 70 goals. Like, yo, Brent, this, I was sitting with one Habs fan, one Sens fan. Like, yo, bro, you think Matthews is going to hit 70 goals? And I said no. And they were surprised because they both think he can do it. And, I mean, I think he can do it. There's potential for him to do it. And I want him to do it. But I think this team has gotten to a point. And when I say the team, I mean the individuals where – They've been around long enough now. They've been through a lot. This group has been through hell and back together. Okay. Are they at a point in their career where they don't really give a shit about anything at all until the playoffs start? And to me, that's not, again, it's not me making an excuse. Like I compare it to say in Tampa won Cubs, but almost Tampa last year. Like, you could tell the second half of the season, they just did not care. Well, we're in, we're not intimidated by anyone. And look what they did. They were the three seed taking on the two seeds. They start on the road and they shellacked the Leafs in game one. Well, that made up for the last 40 games we didn't play well. So I'm I'm not saying I'm I'm expecting the Leafs just to like turn it on when it comes to playoff time. But I, I just think you get to a point in your career where the individual stuff doesn't really matter. And people will think, you know, yeah, okay, these guys have egos. Of course it matters. And it does to an extent. But the point I made to those two individuals I was speaking with was, here I am. No one's a bigger Leaf fan than me. Okay. I'm very grateful for Austin Matthews being a Toronto Maple Leaf. This guy won the Calder Rookie of the Year. Okay. He won a Hart Trophy. He won the Lindsay. He won back-to-back Maurice Rocket Richard trophies. He'll probably sneak in a Lady Bing at some point. He had a 60-goal year, one of the best seasons uh, as far as goals scored, um, as far as far as goals go that we've seen in the history of the league. If he hits 70, and he knows this, if he hits 70, but this team in the Matthews era doesn't say make a conference final or go on a run. In 20 years from now, am I going to give a shit that in 23, 24, he had 70 goals? No, we're all going to look at Matthews the same. And that's not me saying I think he doesn't want to hit 70 or doesn't care to. I just think these guys are old enough now. They're not going to kill themselves every night because they know. Like, I think we've said in years past that, you know, we got to get home ice or like we got to get the division because we want the easier route. Let's say it, everything stays the yeah, course. Now and we it play, doesn't matter. We play Florida in the first round, Bruno. Does it really matter that we yeah, start on we, the road? We've seen it all. They've lost to shitty teams in the first round. They beat Tampa in the first round. like, And then they lost in five games to Florida in the second round. When you know, Not that we thought it was going to be a cakewalk, but I think everyone picked the Leafs for the most part. The majority of hockey fans picked the Leafs to win that series, even though Florida got through Boston. And they still shit the bed in five games. So, you know, it doesn't matter. Start on the road, play the President's they Trophy winner, play the team that's dead last in the league. Yeah. Like anything's in play for the Leafs in the playoffs. And not, and not to sound arrogant, here we are talking about how 
you know, they're below expectation in terms of the eye test while they're still on pace for a hundred and some odd points. The team can sleepwalk to a hundred points. Right. And they're going to do what, well, this, this is my prediction for the Toronto Maple Leafs 23, 24 season. They're going to go into the all-star break. They're going to come out at some point after the all-star break, they're going to have that run. They do it every year where they win like nine in a row at home or like nine of 11 overall. And that'll obviously push them up the standings and push up the points total. And then when they make those moves at the deadline, I expect another run. So I'm still expecting this team to get like 110 ish points and call me arrogant. I was just saying they don't really give a shit, but I I just think it'll happen regardless because the talent is there. Um, But just to my point before, and this is not me necessarily even talking specifically about the Leafs. I just think it's all teams. You get to a point where, you don't really care. And typically it's the teams that have won before, but I think in the, the Leafs, it, it's the opposite side where they've been heartbroken so many times. They know it doesn't matter and it's different. And I mean, Colorado's near the top of the league and they won a Stanley cup. Vancouver's an example to me where here they are new. They're new to the dance. As far as the elite teams go, they're going to kick ass all regular season. Because like they have a, they're motivated. They've never been here before. They're playing with purpose. Where the teams who've been in this boat for a while, it's hard to drive up that intensity. Um, and two, that's totally connected. Why the Leafs always lose to the bad teams? What is it? Two losses to Ottawa. Two losses to Buffalo. Two losses to Columbus. And two losses to Chicago. Come on, that's not just oh they don't show up. No, they're just th- these are games where. It's just in them not to put it out a hundred. It's something subconscious because they know it doesn't matter. And that that's bullshit. These guys are paid millions of dollars. I'm not happy with it. I just think that's the reality of professional athletes. Once they've gone to that point in their careers. We've talked about this on previous shows in terms of their motivation level. Like, I don't think they're highly motivated either in terms of like winning a president's trophy, finishing as high as possible in the standings. And again, it's not that they don't want to win games and they don't want to play well. I just think they understand that at the end of the day, the regular season just kind of doesn't matter as long as you get in. Now, you don't want to just scratch your way into the playoffs at the end of the season. Like, they don't want to be in that situation. You want to comfortably get in. But what's the point of finishing with 115 points and then, you know playing a team that has like 108 points in the first round and yeah, exactly. (laughs) You know, potentially losing like the Leafs have been through so much shit and they've taken so much shit, not only from the, the local media in Toronto, but just the NHL media and NHL fans in general, like all the jokes, all the memes that have been flying around about this team over the last seven, eight years since the Matthews, Marner and Nylander era began and how they can't win in the first round. They finally got through that last season and then laid an egg in the second round. So I think every player on that team understands that no matter what they do in the regular season, as you said, Matthews can score 70. And here's why I I will disagree with you. Like, I think people will look back on that and be like, holy shit, Austin Matthews scored 70 goals. And then, you know, let's say 30 years down the line, like no one else does it again. I mean, that who knows, right? We we might see a guy that turns in a prime Wayne Gretzky and is scoring 90 goals out here. Like, I, I again, I don't really think that's possible. But if Matthews hits 70 goals, that's rarefied air, man. Like, that yeah. is just next level impressive. Like, I think, and we talked about this on the last show, Matthews came into the season. He knew that Ovechkin had 65 goals. Like, that was his top season. He knows that none of the guys in this era have had two 60 goal seasons. So I think he came in and said, I want that sort of this new generation record. I want to pass Ovechkin hit 66 goals. I want to outdo McDavid from last season who scored, what was it? 64 goals. We were just talking about this on the last show and I already forgot. I think it was 64 that McDavid scored last season. Wanted to get higher than that. And he wants to be the first guy of this new generation to score 60 goals twice in his career. So I think he came into the season with extra motivation considering his down year last year, all the talk about the wrist injury, his down 40 goal season. Uh, I think Nylander was obviously highly motivated for very, very obvious reasons with his contract expiring. And now he's playing out of his mind. Whereas John Tavares, like him and Marner, they still have an extra year on their deal. 
you know, everyone's even talking about how Marner got married in the off season. And maybe uh-huh. that's been a little bit of a distraction. For ah, him. He's finished. So, he's finished. Big mistake. <laughs> so if you have to pick like the two guys on this team who were the most motivated heading into the season, especially the core four, it was definitely Matthews and Nylander. Um, now, obviously, like Domi's playing on a one year deal. Bertuzzi's playing on a one year deal. Samsonov's playing on a one year deal. Those guys have a lot to prove. And one of those guys is not in the NHL right now. So I don't know. It's kind of hard to, to really break down like what motivates these guys. Like I don't talk to these guys on a regular basis. Like, I don't know. Is anyone listening? Like really good friends with these guys and they can tell us what makes these guys tick and what motivates them to come to the rink every day. I, I just think they understand in the grand scheme of things that none of this really matters until they get into the playoffs. Yeah. See, I w- I was using it in somewhat of a negative way saying it affects this team um, that kind of shrinks motivation. But now I'll you do the positive spin that game. They lost to the Sabres nine to three. Okay. In years past, after a game like that, I would have been worried about the team. Oh my God. They got embarrassed in Buffalo. Everyone's going to be making fun of them, shitting on them. The whole story of like, you know, all the Toronto fans go over to Buffalo to watch the game and they got embarrassed. I didn't care because I had it in me. Like, I'm, I think the team is at the point now where I don't think they were phased at all. They woke up the next morning and they were fine and they showed it. They played a great road game against Columbus the next game and won easily. So, again, there's negatives to it and there's positives to it as well. Yeah, they threw that game in the trash. If you go and look at the Colorado Avalanche this season, okay, they are leading the Central Division right now. We all know how great the Avalanche are. They have games this season where they lost 7-0 to the Vegas Golden Knights. They lost 8-2 to the St. Louis Blues. So just those two games combined, they were outscored 15-2. And they also lost 6-2 to the Winnipeg Jets. Like they have suffered some big losses and no one's talking about the avalanche getting blown out by the Jets or the Golden Knights or the St. Louis Blues. But the second anything like that happens to the Leafs, this team stinks, trade every defenseman, go pick up this guy, pick up that guy. Sheldon Keefe has to be fired. But I agree with you. Like when that game happened, I was like, man, we're seeing like so many lopsided games over the last like couple of years. It just feels like with save percentages going down across the National Hockey League, with the regular season meaning less and less, and not even just in hockey, like in all sports in general. Like, look at the NBA. Like, Mm. the regular season is basically a joke at this point. Um, The NFL, to a certain degree as well. I mean, basically, you have the teams that are just fighting for, like, the first round by that number one seed in the NFC and the AFC. And other than that, it's just like, whatever, just get into the playoffs. Um, Even in baseball, like you saw the Arizona Diamondbacks, an 84-win team, make the World Series. Like there's just, the regular season across sports just doesn't mean a whole lot. And we're seeing the same thing in hockey. We're seeing these lopsided scores where teams just don't give a shit. They don't have it one night. They're on the road, second half of a back-to-back. You know, nothing's going right. And all of a sudden the wheels fall off and you lose 9-3 to the Buffalo Sabres. So I think yeah. that's kind of the reality we're living in right now in the National Hockey League. Yeah, as far as no one caring about Colorado losing games like that, we know why, Bruno. It's because they have their cup. And even I'm sure, people were, um, people, I'm sure people were screaming um, when I was going on my rant about how the Leafs not having motivation through all 82 games and pointing to teams like Tampa Bay who maybe feel, you know, they felt that way last year. Well, Tampa's got their cups. So I'll even say they're more allowed to do it than the Leafs. And when a scoreline like that occurs, um, the Leafs are allowed to be shit on more than the team who's got um, a banner in the rafters for a recent Stanley Cup. I'll go through the lightning schedule as well. So they've lost 5-1 to the Rangers, 5-1 to the Predators. They lost 8-1 to the Dallas Stars. They lost 5 Five nothing to the Blues, four nothing to the Hurricanes. I'm trying to see if I can find an even worse loss than that. What's their that, goal differential? That seems like their worst losses of the season. Just kind of quickly throw, uh, scrolling through their their schedule. Bruno, um, Bruno, Tampa's a negative eight goal differential. Yeah, that is that is not good. And listen, like it's not again, it's not like an, a crazy advanced stat by any means, but goal differential 
kind of tells you everything you need to know about how well a team is playing. Like even the Leafs, they're they're plus 10 right now, but that ranks 13th in the NHL in goal differential. So it kind of goes with what we've been preaching a little bit. It's like they're playing well, like they're a 103-point team, but they're not playing great by any means. Like I shouldn't even say they're playing well. Like they're playing good. But they're they're 13th in the NHL in goal differential. The Oilers have passed them now in goal differential. That kind of tells the whole story. Like, look at the standings. Boston, plus 26 goal differential, leading the division. Rangers, plus 21 goal differential, leading the division. Avalanche, plus 24 goal differential. Jets, plus 31 goal differential. The Canucks, plus 46 goal differential. Shit. So when you compare those teams who are... Well, they've beaten up on the Sharks a few times. They were putting up 10 spots fair. on the Sharks. The Pacific Division is is just terrible. But it kind of shows you where all these teams are. All you got to do really is look at goal differential. Again, it's not the be-all and end-all, but it kind of paints a pretty clear picture. Mm. All right, Lepore. We need to talk about William Nylander. We Willie Nylander. Because there have been a lot of takes flying from every corner of the internet on radio, on television. So recently, Nick Kiprios came out and said that he believes that the Leafs are looking at signing Nylander to an eight-year extension for $11.25 million a season. And Elliot Friedman, in his latest 32 Thoughts article, also had some thoughts about this. He did not throw out a number specifically, um, but just looking through the article, where is the lion... I'm looking forward here. Um, okay. Originally, the Maple Leafs hoped they could get this done for under eight figures, but those plans are at the bottom of some landfill. Hmm. They accept this is going to be a massive deal. The question is, how massive? Toronto wants this done. The Leafs recognize his value and would like certainty from him as they consider moves elsewhere around the roster. They are prepared to throw even more wads of cash at him. So... Based on what we're hearing from Kiprios, from Elliot Friedman, it looks like it's going to take at least 10, 5, 11 plus million to get this done. Where before the season, we were talking about Nylander getting like nine, nine and a quarter, nine and a half. This is getting out of control now. Like, wh- what are your thoughts on eight years and over 11 million for William Nylander? I think, I think where the discussion lies is. No one would really be upset or surprised at that deal when you look at it like in an isolated way. It's just the whole thing with the Leafs and just giving this huge contract out and, you know, staying on the same road that uh, that uh, we're on. So, like, I don't think there'd be much criticism of any team that say signed him in free agency for that figure. This guy's top five in scoring and. You locked him up for a long time. You're going to pay. I think where it lies with the Leafs is, well, Matthews just signed an extremely large contract. Marner makes a lot of money. Tavares makes a lot of money. And we'll see where John is the year after next. But can we like just keep doing this? And like we haven't been successful. Um, So I'm mixed with it, man. Because I don't want to see Willie go. But at the same time, it's kind of cringy. And it brings me a little bit of fear that we're just staying on this same path. I don't know. I also have the take too, where and people go on the rant of like, oh, you can't give all your forwards that this much money. I don't think it really matters because, like, I, I, and when I say that across the board, let's say you you stack your D or you give money to your goalie, whatever. We just talked about the playoffs and how the margins are small. You can have a superstar forward group that just takes over in a series and wins you the series. Your goalie can steal you a series. I just think where every team sits is they have to find a place to get value as far as contracts go. So say in in the Leafs case, it's on D. We got to find value in D and I guess value in nets because our forward group is at a ridiculous level, both talent wise and pay wise. So I won't hate it if Willie signs for a number like that because I think he deserves it. And let's face it, Willie's consistent. He's been pretty freaking consistent over the course of his career and the trajectory's gone up. So like I wouldn't have fear that like this deal's gonna blow up in our face and William Nylander will always be a tradable asset. Um, 
but I will understand the takes on the other side that's saying, here we go again. We're in the same boat and it hasn't been successful and people not being happy about it. I think things are getting a little out of control. Now, anyone who knows me knows I'm like the biggest William Nylander supporter. I have been from day one. He's he's in the same books as as Morgan Riley for me. Like everyone knows how much I love Morgan Riley. Like I love William Nylander. This team would be absolutely screwed without him. His ability to create offense by himself, his ability to drive a line by himself, his ability to score, to play make, to play with anyone, to play on the power play, to skate the puck through the neutral zone, zone entries, you name it. This guy's a superstar. But I think we're getting a little bit out of control here. And what pisses me off is this Toronto tax. Like, why does every Leaf have to sign these massive deals that no one else is signing? Why does Austin Matthews have to sign a four-year deal or a four-year extension when every other star in the league is signing an eight-year extension? So why is it only these Leafs who are the outliers in all these situations? That's what is continuing to, fr- to frustrate me about this situation. I don't think you have to give him 11 and a quarter million. Like, why can't he sit at 10, a shade over 10? And I understand the cap is going up. It's going up, what, $4 million next season? So that's going to give the Leafs a little more breathing room, every team more breathing room. And then you you can say, oh, but if William Nylander hit the open market, of course he would get 11 and a quarter million. Well, guess what? None of these star players have hit the open market. The only guy who did is what? Basically, John Tavares, who signed with the Leafs. Like, what other star player, unless I'm just completely forgetting one, who hit the open market, and just went to the highest bidder, like superstar player. Like, is there someone that's that you can name off the top of your head? Maybe I'm just completely blanking on this, but it's it just seems like all of the star players are just re-upping with their teams. Like, even go back to like um to the Miko Rantanen and like Braden Point. Like, these guys are really good players. Rantanen scored 50 goals last year, Braden Point scored 50 goals last year. They still stayed within like the structure of what all the rest of the guys on their teams were getting paid. Like you're telling me Miko Rantanen doesn't deserve more. I think he's making like nine and a quarter million. Braden point is not making that much money. Like these guys deserve to be getting a little bit more, but of course it's just William Nylander Lepore who now has to make over 11 million. Like it's just, I get it. He's a great player. I love the guy, but I just think we're getting a little bit out of control here, throwing all this cash at him. I mean, I don't know. Like, Could you see it getting to a point where the Leafs are like, you know what? We'll let you walk to free agency. Go see what else is out there. And then once you realize that you might not get what you want, just come back to us. Yeah, maybe. But is it just a matter of like the the Leafs have the worst timing in the world? Because they sign these guys to these big contracts and then COVID hits. Okay. And it fucked us because then all these other stars who signed – um signed for less because the cap wasn't moving up and people are pointing at me and laughing i'm like no but like you do look at it most of the big contracts in the nhl are from pre-covid like eric carlson like 11.5 million how many years ago did he get that deal dowdy 11 million no that was the expectation for Tavares. everyone knew he was gonna get 11 plus million matthews mcdavid eichel all these big huge contracts are before the lockout so now the timing's brutal in the way that all their contracts are coming to an end and there's all this stuff about the cap going up again. So it's, it's, it's bad timing. It's unfortunate. We'd have to look at a list of guys who will be free agents. And like, is there any other really big free agent this summer or someone scheduled to be free agent? And then even going I gotta into look next at the year. upcoming UFAs. I yeah. can't even name one off the top of my head. That's like a star player. Yeah. The thing is too, right? Like it, it is isolated in the way of uh, the team you play for because yeah, like to look Willie in the face and say, okay, you know, Rantanen makes this or so-and-so makes this. Why do you deserve 11 million? Well, Marner makes just under 11 million and he signed how many years ago and he's on my team. Like that's the reasoning for this. It just, it, it set a certain precedent that it's fucking tough, man. Guys are going to say, well, this guy's making that on this team. Like, and the Leafs can say, if, if he points to someone, if if he was pointing to someone making that kind of money on another team, well, you could say, well, then go play for them. Here, this is how we do it. Where 
you're sitting there saying, yeah, no, we give our star players a lot of money. So it, it is what it is. Yeah, like, this is the culture the Leafs have set. Yeah. Matthews, 13 and a quarter million. Tavares, I know he was a UFA, 11 million. Mitch Marner makes just under 11 million. I now have a list, Lepore, of the pending UFAs, and there's a big one who I for- completely forgot about. Steven Stamkos oh, is hitting wow. the open market. Yeah. Uh, Pedersen's an RFA. And he's probably going to get a massive extension from the Vancouver Canucks. That'll be interesting. That'll be interesting to see. Because, again, comparing with this new cap, Pedersen's a good one to measure against Nylander. Yeah, that's like almost a perfect comparable. I mean, I know Pedersen's a centerman and Nylander's a winger. But, I mean, that's a pretty damn close comparable just based on their... I mean, Pedersen's a little bit younger, but... Yeah, but I'm just saying more he's a star player. He's a yeah, slam exactly. star Yeah, exactly. They're player, both like, so. what? Well, let's call it top... 15 to 20 players in the league pretty yeah. much uh so sam wh- sam reinhardt another one I, I know he's having a great season but i wouldn't put him on the cal the you know the same caliber as nylander and and petterson i forgot about reinhardt yeah i forgot about him jake gensel as well is mm. a is an unrestricted free agent so there are some interesting names uh the more i look at this but um yeah i mean it's just man it's a little bit too rich for me like i i listen i think the leafs are going to resign him it's going to get done i want it to get done i just feel like we're all going to be a little bit disappointed when this number comes in and it's a lot more than we all expected would you rather have pet what do you expect patterson to sign for well listen he's their franchise centerman they're in the middle of a great season. And I know Demko is, you could argue, is the MVP of the team, even like Quinn Hughes. like It's kind of insane to say. You could say right now that like Elias Pettersson is the third most important player on the Canucks, but he is their franchise centerman. He's coming in, I would imagine, at least like 10 and a half per. Oh, so I think he's going to get more. Like 10 and a half to 11 million, you would think. But who knows? Think- because all these teams, they, they 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 sign all their star players for less. It's just the Leafs, Lapore. The Leafs are the only team who sign their players for more money. But again, the t- the timing of the cap going up. Like I'm expecting Pedersen to sign for like between eleven and twelve million. Okay. Like long term. So then, like like I'll ask you that: Would you rather have say Pedersen at twelve? And I might be completely wrong, and he signs for much less. Would you rather have Pedersen at twelve or Nylander for eleven? I'd rather I'd rather have Nylander. I think Nylander is. I think he's a more dynamic player. I think he's a better Ooh. goal scorer than Pedersen. Like, I think Pedersen... Look, Pedersen's, like, a very good all-around player, and he's a centerman. But I don't know, man. I think I think Nylander's a little bit more dynamic, and Canucks fans might come at me and call me a complete idiot, but I totally believe that. Like, I think Nylander has, like, 50-goal upside, 40-50-goal upside, whereas I don't think Pedersen is quite that caliber of goal scorer, even though Pedersen's put up... He put up 100 points last year. So he's had like bigger, just pure point production seasons than the Nylander. Well, really, it was one big point production season he had, which was last year. But I think Nylander's a better goal scorer. And Nylander's gotten it done in the playoffs. Like he's been their best playoff player the last number of years. He's essentially been a point per game guy in the playoffs. So I don't know, man. I think we're all just going to be pissed off again. We're going to come on the pod after he signs this. And we're, we're going to be happy, but we're also going to be like, really? Like we did it again? And we overpaid someone again. Yeah. You you planted the seed in my head. Now, now my mood will change based on what Pedersen signs for. Because if Willie signs for like the 11 2, 5, and Pedersen legit signs for nine and a half, I'll fucking smash something. Like yeah. now you're here. Now we're just a joke. We're just a big joke and we're handing out money. Well, now was 11 2, 5 being thrown out there because that's simply what David Pastor 90 million. Makes? Well, they said again, and it's 90 million on the nose because everyone loves to compare Pasternak to, to Nylander. They're, I believe, they're the same age. Um, you know, they're, they're friends. Pasternak just signed his big deal. He did the same thing where he was, he, he was a pending UFA, he waited till March to sign his extension. And he makes 11 and a quarter million a year. So would you rather have David Pasternak or William Nylander? I think all of us objectively would rather have David Pasternak. Like this is probably the second best goal scorer in the world behind Austin Matthews. Uh, Hmm. So I'm taking, I'm taking David Pasternak. Like, would you take Pasternak over, over William Nylander? For the same money. Yeah. But Pasternak, again, he signed before the cap increase was announced. Yeah. But 
you have to think these teams knew even last season, like, all right, the cap is going to go Fair up enough. at some yeah. point here. So I don't know. Like, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's just so Toronto, man. It's just so Toronto. I, and I know we're going to talk about this so much more as we get inch closer and closer to this. And you, who knows? Like, it could come down at any time. Like, we could see a tweet at any moment that Nylander has signed the extension. I just, I don't know, man. I hope this 1125 is not, is not the actual number because at some point you have to, you have to start building a little bit more of a balanced roster. Like I love paying like your elite players, a lot of money, give them the money they deserve. But at some point, like insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So you can't possibly run it back with these four guys again. Now it might have, it's going to happen for one season because Tavares is still going to be on the books, but I mean, this can't continue like years down the line where you have then Nylander, Marner, and Tavares or Nylander, Marner, and Matthews locked up. And then then Tavares comes back for like, I don't know, eight or nine million. Like you just can't do that, man. Nah, he's not doing that. So anyway, you want to talk about, let's talk about the all-star game now. Yeah, Because we can probably go on for hours about Nylander, but the uh, NHL all-star rosters have been announced the first 32 players named to the all-star game in toronto the game is at scotia bank arena in toronto on february 3rd yeah so that's going to be very exciting it's been i believe 24 years since the all-star game was in toronto wasn't it the year 2000 they did the first year of the acc yeah. okay so it was like 99 2000 yeah exactly so it's been a long time matthew's is the only Leaf who's been named to the roster. So there's going to be 12 that make it in through the fan vote. There's going to be eight additional skaters and four goaltenders. So I think Nylander's probably going to make the team. Like, I, I'm, I'm sure Leaf fans are going to go hard and get him in via the fan vote. Um, but what are your thoughts on the All-Star rosters and uh, just how many Leafs, I guess, you think are going to make the team? Uh, I mean, just going over the roster, m- most of it's pretty expected i wonder if it caught guys are different personalities man and as we touched on earlier in the show some of these guys have egos how they start with the one guy per team there's probably some fucking bitterness going around those locker rooms like what do you mean he got picked and some debate inside locker rooms but for the most part i mean they pick the big guys they get picked it'll be interesting to see who gets added as far as the leafs go it's tough because nylander's got to be there based on his his numbers but there's always that thing of like the home team always seems to get maybe one or two extra guys who don't really deserve to be there so i don't know like does marner get in out of or even riley morgan riley, yeah i think has a shot too yeah for sure but riley's had a great season yeah low-key so it'll be fun i like i, I like how they're, they're bringing the draft back that'll be yes fun. that's gonna be awesome yeah if, if if you were doing the draft, right, if you were the guy who's in charge of your team, what's the approach you would take? Like, would you take all your buddies? Would you actually try to build a team? Would you take all the guys who, you know, say play for your team? Let's <laughs> see if a few guys who play for your team on the board, you take them. It's fun, man. It's interesting. I, and even I would then, take my buddies, especially if they're good. That's wow. what I would do. So, and and just to set that up, Lapore. So, reports are it's not a hundred percent official yet as of recording, but McDavid and Matthews are going to be the captains, and I think they're going to be joined by a celebrity guest to help Ooh. them pick their teams. Well, NHL celebrities aren't exactly a list, so I'm not looking forward. Yeah, to that. fair enough. We'll see who these celebrities end up being. But like, if I'm Matthews, I'm I'm picking my buddies like straight up. And I don't know if like who his best friends are like outside. Like, I know he's like good friends with like Matthew Kachuk probably friends with like Eichel as well but I don't know like I'm picking my friends that's how I would approach it unless my friends just absolutely stink and they're my best friends Boone Jenner who made the all-star game because it's kind of a sham that they have to invite someone from every team in the NHL which I think is listen I understand why they're doing it and you want to include all the teams you don't want any fan bases left out but it's it's kind of a joke yeah do they try to do like a USA versus Canada thing Oh, if that happens naturally, how sick would that be? I mean, there's other countries involved. Yeah. But you try to make it as close to like you, like McDavid just doesn't pick any Americans. Matthews (laughs) doesn't pick any Canadians. Oh, that would be incredible. Or no, it would be hilarious. 
it'd be like, okay, Matthews gets first pick and he goes, I'll take Leon Dreisaitl. <laughs> and then McDavid goes and he's like, you know, I'm going to take William Nylander. And they just, oh, that would be great. Hey, Dreisaitl, by the way, he didn't even make the initial 32 right. man roster, but you got to think he he's going to be there, right? Like he'll yeah. get voted in as well, just yeah. like Nylander. But no, that would be awesome. Yeah, I like and also it, yeah. something that's intriguing me about the uh, the All Star Weekend as well is that they're handing out a million dollars to the winner of the skills competition. I think that is going to be the event to watch of the weekend. So I believe it's I want to say it's twelve guys who are competing in the skills competition for like the million, where they have to compete in at least four of six events, and then based on the points that they accumulate in those events, they then move on to like a final event. And I think it's a breakaway challenge. And then from there, they're going to decide who the the million dollar winner is. So that's going to be pretty sick. Like, could you imagine being the first guy to win that, to win the million? So it's and, a guy. It's not yeah, a team. One a dude, team no, one dude is going to oh. win the million, the, the million dollars. It's a million. I thought USD. like the winning team got a million. Oh, yeah. Okay. That, it's it's going to be, well, no, it's going to be exciting. wild, man. Can you imagine it? Imagine it comes down to like Matthews versus McDavid for the million in the skills competition. <laughs> that would be so cool so uh, to me that's that's the marquee event of the weekend is yeah. the uh, all-star skills competition well i'll be rooting for uh, i'll be rooting for nylander in that competition oh you know what though nylander's got a he's got a, he's a live he's a live player to win this thing man like he he has a great shot he can fly he can stick handle he's uh, he might well, win was... he might win it man I was gonna say I was gonna I'm uh, I'll be rooting for him. So hopefully he whatever million he wins he takes it off his uh, contract. <laughs> yeah. But you know why they're you know why they're doing this, Bruno? It's so it's so obvious, and it's the world we live in now. Think of the betting that's gonna go on now. Everyone's gonna be betting on this. Who who bet on the skills competition before? Now you're oh, gonna yeah. see all you're gonna see all the lists and like oh so and so is like forty to one. That's a good bet. I'll throw some cash at that. It's why they're doing it, man. And it's exciting. And for people, you know, who dabble in that stuff, it's great. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, like I said, I thought it was like they're gonna make two different teams and the team gets a million, but the fact that it's one guy now, I'm definitely tuning in because that's a plus entertainment. And because it entices these players to actually try. Freaking right. Because listen, I know that some guys are trying in certain competitions, but there are a number of competitions where it's just very clear that no one gives a shit and they're just kind of going through the motions. You know, if you're one of those guys in it, you're going to be skating like the wind. You're going to put everything into your hardest shot. You're putting everything into every competition that you're competing in. Now, only four of the six competitions are going to count towards like your point total, but we're going to see some cool shit. It's, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I'm wondering, hmm, hmm. I think the, the one thing about the most is the fastest lap. Because I've heard guys say, I think McDavid said it one year, like either right before he went or right after he went, he kind of referenced like, I'm not going to blow, like go balls to the wall and blow my hamstring at the skills competition. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? So now it's kind of interesting to see how guys are approaching the money's on the line. Yeah. I love it. Is there, yeah. is there anything else you want to get off your chest before we wrap up this podcast? I'm good, Bruno. You got me pumped for the all-star game, man. Very, very, I know, very You think exciting. the NHL's paying me to promote the skills competition <laughs> yeah uh no i'll be tuning into that any even too right let's face it the skills competition has been kind of embarrassing for the last little while with how cheesy it is and how there's all these gimmicks so it's nice that we'll actually watch and hopefully get a little excited yeah I i'm very excited and on top of that the fact that it's in toronto uh, it's gonna be a big event for the city hot um, ticket you know, i'm sure it would be a hell of a lot bigger if the Leafs actually made a deep playoff run. That would get people way more excited than the All Star Game and the Skills Competition. But listen, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a very good time in Toronto uh, during All Star Weekend in February. So really looking forward to that. How expensive is that? How expensive is that ticket? I wonder. Oh man, someone, uh, someone's got to tell us in the comments. Yeah, because it could go either way, right? Like obviously, oh, I see all the All Stars, but at the same time, it's like a scrimmage. So it's I mean, still going to be the most expensive all-star weekend. Oh, of course. Probably is. the last like 25 years. Of course it is. To you're probably going to have to take out a mortgage payment to go. You're going to have to take out a mortgage just to go to the game. So yeah, and sit in standing room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. That is going to do it for episode 128 of the Glens for Punishment podcast or GFP. 
a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. Uh, once again, you know, I say this at the end of every every episode. If you are a longtime listener, first time listener, and you really enjoyed the show, whatever you are, um, it would be amazing if you can give us a five star rating and review on either Apple or Spotify. It does so much to help the show. And if you're watching us on YouTube and you enjoyed the content, smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below. And while you're at it, ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. For Michael Lapore, I'm Anthony Bruno. Go Leafs go, and we will see you in the next one. Thanks, everyone. Let's go, my mama, and I say, yo, slow.